Welcome back Filmholics, my name is Kyle Kendrick and this is to Find Anything and Everything Filmmaking. So we just got the announcement of the A7S 3 This camera we've been waiting for for years upon years, almost seven years actually, I think. And I had the A7S 2 I returned it, no I didn't return it, I sold it back and so that I have some savings and some staple to buy this camera. But I wasn't sure if I was going to buy it because the Canon R5 and R6 came out. But they have overheating issues. So I, I was just in a pickle. Do I go to Panasonic? Do I go to Sony? Do I go to Canon? And there's just so many choices to pick from. And honestly, we're blessed. We're blessed for that. But today I decide if I'm going to get it. So let's talk about what this camera can do. Basically, why did they say that the S4 A7S means supreme and sensitivity? So let's go ahead and get started on the spec. So this video is not going to be a hands-on review because I don't have my hands on it. I'm mainly going to be talking about the features I like most and why I might buy it. But for now, let's go ahead and get into the specs like I said before. So the thing I'm most excited about, the thing that really, really makes me want to buy this camera is the thing that a lot of people have been requesting from Sony. And a lot of competition has been implementing. And the thing I've been missing out on, as you guys can tell, I love me my color. I love the fact that changing colors in post can change the tone of the movie. Look at Matrix, look at John Wick, look at other, just, I love so many examples of this. And I get it's more stylistic and less of story, but if you base the style to the story, it works so well, like I said in John Wick. It's beautiful. And the fact that this camera has 422 10-bit, which means I can actually color grade to the full extent of what I want and what my computer and my whole film style can do. It's just beautiful that I could do that. I am so excited that they are finally implementing that and I, I just absolutely love it. Okay, second thing. Now, we all know that we, <laughs> we YouTubers love slow motion. We use it all the time in our cinematics. It just creates this cool and surreal moment of like either sentimentality, if you're like doing something with people, and just something epic if you're doing something with travel. It just creates a whole new look and a whole new perspective and it's beautiful. It feels like you're in there. Now, that being said, this camera is capable of doing 240 frames per second in 1080p. That's not something to laugh about. Yeah, it's not 4K, but that's still 240 frames. A RED camera way back in the first Hobbit movie. Yes, I know, The Hobbit, not great, but the fact that their slow motion was 300 frames per second, and now we have a consumer camera that can do almost that? A consumer camera that can do something a RED camera can do? Insane. But another thing is, in 4K, it can do 120. In 4K, it can do 60. And all, all of that is still in 10-bit 422. That's just mind-blowingly just... But... When I read that as just a rumor, I was just like, there's no way. There's no way Sony would do that because Panasonic is the one that if you want a lot of slow motion and so a lot of variability, you get a Panasonic. Or if you want good color science, you go to Canon. Speaking of color science, that goes to the next part that I want to talk about. Sony knows that they have a problem with color science. That weird magenta, this magenta right here, it used to look like this as skin tone, but instead, they took the color science of their FX9 and tried to implement it into the A7S III. That is so beautiful because that is a cinema camera. Their S-Log in that camera is insane. A lot of people use that camera for filming, like features. The fact that we're gonna have that color science in a, in, in a consumer camera, it's gonna be so it's gonna be a workhorse for filmmaking. I, I just I can't wait to see projects filming this, especially if they do something more of like vaporwave or like cyberpunk-ish, just something Blade Runner-esque. I would love if somebody tried to do that and tried to color grade that. Oh my god. Oh, so excited. But another thing that this camera can do is something that is so basic that I don't even know why they haven't done this yet. Like, they had a flip out screen, like the one I have on my A6400, but it, it's finicky, it, 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 it's weird, it's just awkward in every sense of the way. And they have a fully articulate screen, 
that you can use touchscreen on. And, and you can use it on the menu, which is weird that I can't do that. They still haven't had a firmware update of us being able to do that in the A6400, which I thought would be a basic thing to change because it, you already can do touchscreen on the whole screen. Like if I touch the, like an edge up here, it'll focus there instead of my face. But I guess, you know, they just waited for the next camera to make it the Supreme. Now, another thing that this camera can do upon all the stuff I just mentioned is the fact that I can do 16-bit raw, externally only, but still, the fact that an Animus can't even record that yet is insane. They are working on a firmware update to do 16-bit raw. I, I want to get both of those things and try to color grade that. I can't even imagine how it would feel to just have that much detail and work on my on my videos. I wouldn't even be using that unless I'm doing a short or feature, which I'll, I'm not even working on a feature ever for a long time. I'm gonna be mainly working on shorts and I'm gonna try and work on that now. With that being said, and everything said and done, everything I just mentioned, it's also able to do the eye autofocus in every mode. That's insane to me. Yes, we're able to do that now, but in the same time, being able to I auto do, do, do I auto focus is like yeah I don't use I auto focus all the time especially when I'm doing something like a narrative or a commercial or anything like that but if I'm relying on myself to record myself like vlogging or something like this something simple that just goes on a channel that's not a cinematic then I'm gonna be relying on I auto focus it keeps me in focus without having another person in front of me and that's just such a great reliability for me to have if I'm going to be creating content as much as I do. Other extra features that I want to mention that I'm excited about that a lot of people are mentioning is the recording limit, which I don't necessarily always need to go and record over 30 minutes. But if I ever needed to, that's that's nice that it doesn't have a recording limit. Another thing that I really, really like is the fact that it's 15 stops of dynamic range. And from what I saw in Jared, uh, Jared Undone, he said that there's 13 stops usable of, well, dynamic range. But in the same time, like having that capability in S-Log, if I'm going to be recording then, if that way I can actually do a lot more with the 10-bit that it comes with. So that's a good, that's also a good thing. But in the same time, my camera can do like 13 stops, probably 11 stops in, uh, in uh, usable. But with that being said, it's a great upgrade and I'm a colorist, so it helps me out. Now, the last thing I debated on not mentioning just because I love Canon to death, but they've been botching so much, so so much of their mirrorless cameras. The, there's crop factors and there's just a bunch of things that just doesn't make sense, like not being able to film in in uh, 24 frames per second that, in that, I think that was the M50 or the R, I don't even remember, they're just botching a lot. And now they have recording limits of only eight minutes in 8K or just overheating issues, but the passive cooling system in the A7 III creates it to not overheat. It's like they had somebody inside Canon and like sabotaged their whole overheating and said, yeah, let's not put cooling so that our camera is better. They're advertising it just so well. And I just feel so bad that I, the, my love for Canon because their color science, their, their lenses are beautiful. And I would love to go back to them, but I really can't, not with how much they're upgrading the Sony. The fact that they're listening to us, the what, what to what we want a new camera to be. I'm literally dying from how much I love this camera because I, I wanted to get back into Canon, but the thing is I have Sony lenses, I have Sony products, and I've gotten so used to Sony's that I'm finally feeling like it's paying off. And especially when I had the A7S II and it was so difficult to try and learn. It This camera, it, it's a great camera, but learning how to color grade it, learning how to finick with the settings it was just so difficult. And the fact that Sony listens to us and tries to make a better product each time they make a new product, it's, it's paying off each time they release the camera, like the a7 III, a6400, and a bunch of other features that are just coming up with 
all the cameras that they're releasing for either photography or film work. But to kind of get into this, there is one pitfall. That pitfall is with everything going on in the world and unemployment being like a thing that is unsure uh, where like we don't know how long it's gonna be things are ending like this extra 600 stimulus checks and the new policy is still being like kind of worked on i guess uh, no one really knows what's going on with that and for me not being employed a price like 3500 is pretty hard and yes there's payment plans but it's something to debate about do I really need this camera? And the thing is, there's two things to really think about. A lot of people are gonna be buying this camera because it is a workhorse. It is gonna be an amazing camera to be able to use all the time for so many different things. And if I'm gonna be filming for other people, they're gonna want certain things. They're gonna want really, really good footage all the time. And sometimes they request you to work on a certain camera. I personally see the investment of understanding every camera as much as possible. That's why even if I don't go into Canons or if I don't go into Panasonic's or if I don't go into Sony's, I still like to know as much on how to use a certain camera to a certain degree so I can get a certain result that they want. So with this being up on par with like a black magic, uh pocket camera it, it it's difficult to kind of see where things are going and where i should go towards it's like what do i do i have lenses for an aps-c and this is a the uh full frame camera and all the lenses i have full frame cameras aren't autofocus cameras they're all manual prime lenses and I'm gonna need to work, uh, get a lens that can do autofocus so that I can create content more like this. And it's, it's just getting into a whole different ecosystem meanwhile staying in the same ecosystem. It's weird. And as you can tell, there are many, many factors to really think about when you're getting into a new camera. How much do you need to spend on it? Uh, and how much do you need to insure it? Because if it's gonna be a camera that big, you're gonna, gonna need to insure that. And upon that, you're also going to need better and heavier equipment and under and just take the time to understand that camera, understand what it needs, new batteries, because I run with the APS-C line, which is still the old batteries, which is not great, but they're still they still work. I mean, right now it cut down to 50 percent and it was 100 percent before and I've only been recording about 30 minutes. Um, yeah really awkward so what what do i decide what do i do well that's the easy thing upon having dreams and aspirations that is almost unreachable in your head where you just kind of go tiny goal to reach bigger goal at each times and trying to get up there there's gonna be always risk involved especially when it comes to having a dream in your life time where like you want to achieve so much. And if you look at a bunch of people who've succeeded, they have always risked so much. But in the same time, it's that step, that extra step. It's easy to say, take some risks and achieve your goals. It's so easy just to say, but it's so hard to step into that risk to get out of your comfort zone. I hate mentioning this because it's so cliche, but I absolutely just, I, I live by this. And I understand Casey has said it. I understand TV shows have said it. I understand so many celebrities, so many role models have said this, but it's just because it's somewhat true. Basically, first thing in life to ever do is to find out what you want to achieve in your lifetime. What is your dream? What is your why? And I love that because that why question means what makes you live and breathe. And then after you find that thing out, which is the hardest step to find it, is the easy part. Every decision that you're ever gonna make has to be based on that, that goal. And sometimes people have multiple goals. Mine is to provide for 
well, the family I'm trying to work on where I have a relationship, I have a serious relationship actually. So in the same time, I'm trying to be able to maintain a living and also achieve the goals I have involving filmmaking. And with that in mind, this risk, buying this camera, $3,000 down the drain, or well, the $200, 200-ish dollars a month, I think it's worth it because you'll never get anywhere if you don't risk yourself. Life in general is a risk. So I guess the moral of this or what I'm trying to say is if this camera or if this yeah, like anything that you're deciding on is not involving your dream, don't do it. But if it is just you holding yourself back, don't do that either. Sorry if that was a long video. I just had a lot to say involving risk on buying gear, on investing on yourself, on deciding decisions. <laughs> but that's just all I have to say about it. I guess I'll end it on that. And also, of course, like and subscribe and dream on.